Hello everyone, this is Counter Yolo, bringing you another video talking about Star Trek Online. And in this video, I'm going to talk about whether or not you should be a tank player inside of the game. Now, tanking is definitely not a strategy that most people recommend for you. Most people will veer you towards doing lots and lots of DPS inside the game. But there definitely is a very good niche and a lot of very good reasons to actually play a tank inside the game. So, in this type of, in this type of video, I'm going to go over, first off my own personal journey in Star Trek Online, first off and how my personal mentality works inside of most other video games, and then how I got veered into tanking in Star Trek Online. I'll then go over why you should tank in STO and the three tanking methods. So um, feel free to see the links in the description for the various time codes for those different parts inside this video. So first off, let's talk about me and other multiplayer games. Now, if you start looking looking at stuff on the left, you'll see that in basically every other game, I'm not actually a tank. With the exception of PvPP and Star Wars The Old Republic, everything else in here, I'm very more towards that support, healer, buffer, debuffer, buffer and debuffer type of person inside of other MMOs and multiplayer games in general. These are, these are three more prominent ones that are kind of more popular that I play. There are other ones too that I play as well, but these, these are, are the three main ones. The Old Republic, D&D, &D, and League of Legends. Um, but yeah, like in terms of all this stuff, I'm the person that's that that's typically the healer. I typically stay a little, a little bit farther back, make sure that my allies are, are keeping their health up and staying alive. In Star Trek Online, that route seemed to be a lot more complicated though. Um, when I was looking at the stuff for the three different professions, tactical, engineering, and science, obviously I'm not a DPS person. That's just not how I am. When I played sports back in high school, middle school, whatever, if there was an offense and a defense for a sport, I always went to the defense. My philosophy always was, you know, if I'm making sure that the enemy can't score, then we can't lose. You know, and basically it's on the offense to make sure that we actually win. The defense just makes sure that we don't lose. So, and that was my, my mentality going forward with everything. Um, but yeah, so I definitely wasn't going to be a tactical captain. Unfortunately, though, when I started reading up on things online, the science profession just seemed way too complicated for me. Um, now, the science has gotten a lot more simplistic over the years. It's still complicated, but it was much more complicated back in 2013. Um, I think I might have evolved a little bit from, from the beta. I still need to read up on a little bit more things from the beta and things for when I used to go over more videos in January, but yeah. Basically what it came down to was, was that tactical definitely wasn't my wasn't to my play style and science was too complicated, so I went with the engineer overall for the, the different professions. Fabrications were still awesome. They were fun to play. I didn't start playing regularly though until April of 2014. I remember that vividly because we had the surface tension mission that came out and it was an extremely fun mission but because we didn't have the level of scaling that we do today i was my first time i played this mission because i was loving at captain that time and i saw the mission pop up i'm like oh hey well i'm a level, level 10 captain i'll play this level 50 mission with a level 10 captain the ground esd part of, of, of the mission took a very long time to beat um the enemies took a very long time to hit. I had to use um, Tuvok a lot to basically help tank a little bit because my character just wasn't powerful enough. And then the final boss on ESD just took forever to beat. It was a fun battle. And I definitely look back at my memory of STO and I call that my favorite battle in the entire game, actually, of all the battles in STO. But um, yeah, it was definitely different. Um, also, back in this time period, I had seven different Star Trek Online accounts because I kept on running out of character slots. When it comes to Canon 2, I kept on loving lot, lots of characters, getting them to level 50, and like, all right, that's that's cool. I'm not super into the end game content. Let's just play another, another character. Um, I guess it's part of my problem that I was also playing a lot of Star, uh, Star Wars The Old Republic at the time. And that's kind of what I did with a lot of the free to play characters there, too. But um, anyway, really, with all this, I mean, like, I did a lot of different combos with different races and teams on the ground. This is much more for fun rather than for viability, which is why I can't really look at this time back here and tell you which races were actually better than others. 
I, I did a lot of this stuff based upon looks rather than the actual stats of my bridge officers and my actual captain that I was using. So, but uh, things changed significantly whenever um, summer came out with the Delta Rising expansion. We got the level cap to 60. Um, we got some new tier 5U and well, tier 6 ships with the upgrade token for T5 ships become T5U ships for some T5 ships, not all, but some. And but I was like, well, whatever. I've got a uh, nice side just use use my main engineer, the one I started off with for a while. And I used him with his tier 4 sovereign, and I decided to tackle the Delta Quadrant with the Delta Rising expansion. And then I faced the Vodwar, and I had tons of issues. My first encounter, the first mine, blew me up. I thought it was just a fluke or a bug. I tried to find him again. The first mine again blew me up. And um, so I left the mission, and I looked at my mission difficulty, and I'm like, okay, is this on advanced or elite? Because this seems way too difficult. It seems way, way, way too difficult. And so I looked through this and I'm like, no, I'm playing on normal. Make sure of that. I went to the mission again. And again, I, I, I kept on trying to take this guy out. I couldn't damage him before I, I kept on dying from, from the mines. Like it just what it came down to the point that it was so frustrating. I eventually left several times and got more damage resistance rating for my ship. And then I saw, you know what? If I can't beat this guy this way, I'm going to beat him the way that I beat one of one of the first enemies in um, the game. Um, when I, so, okay, so just for some reference for you all, um, one time when I was playing through the game, just trying to level up, I tried to play level, I, I was trying to play some content at level 30 with my starter ship, just because I wanted to have, have, have some fun. And I realized that at that certain point, I couldn't actually fight them. So I'm like, well, let's just do... Uh, jet war plasma and mines and just have, have them chase me to death and so that's that's how i beat some of the missions and then i got the, my real tier three ship and i started playing again and it was fine realizing at this point that i had had a similar situation that you know i was two ranks down and so my ship was probably not viable to actually be, be, be played here all right i'll use the same method then jet war plasma and mines and i did that and I did beat the Bob War guys slowly. And I did that through the entire Delta Rising missions. Every single one of them. And by the way, keep in mind, this is this is the time in which you had to get to level 60 to, to finish the last, last couple of missions in Delta Rising to actually face off against um, the Bob War guys at, at, at their home planet. It was an insane grind back then to get to level 60. Nowadays, it's almost like you get to the level 50 and then it like zooms to 65 now. It, 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 it's crazy how fast the, the leveling up the leveling up process is now. Like right now, getting from 50 to 65 takes less experience than getting from 50 to 60 back here in Delta Rising. That's that, that that's how much the extent of difference in experience was between then and now. So yeah, I got through the mission that way, but then I was like, all right, I need to find a way to die less quickly and so my method first off was a little while later they announced that there was going to be this anniversary ship called the Kabali Samsar Cruiser and I was like this thing looks awesome it has super nice stats um that's basically my sovereign class but tier six and different looks and so I was like I'm all for this and so I grinded and got this ship and this was a ship that, that I used for a while um and great stats, plus I had a great survival console, which is super nice. That was that was a clicky one that I could use on any starship. Plus, the, the warp core on, that came with this ship combined with a three-piece Kabali set from the Dust to Dust mission allowed for an extremely, at least for me at the time, seemingly very strong survival um, set. In fact, um, Darkblade on, on, on his channel, he still uses that four-piece Kabali set in his builds today. Um, now, back then I was also really stupid. I'm not afraid to say I was stupid, but I was definitely stupid back then. And I used all five of my engineering slots with, with Neutronium Alloys because I wanted lots of damage resistance rating. Oh, boy. I'm glad I'm I'm not that bad now. But um, after a lot of discussions, I think I started making better builds. But um, back then, I also used a lot of Plaza Beam Arrays because I like broadsiding and just seemed the easiest method to go. 
And also because I wasn't did have a lot of DPS, I'm like, well, if I can't do DPS, I, I can at least do a lot of threat and try to get some enemies to, to fight me instead of my allies who have more DPS than me. So I use Plaza Beamer Rays with the experimental Plaza Beamer Ray from the Romulan Re Reputation, which, which at this time, this guy had um, zero power drain. A little while later, like a year or two later, they did remove that passive from this weapon. Um, rumors that I've heard is that the tier six disruptor beam array has this has this um, zero power drain backed on it. I can't confirm that though, so I'm gonna try this try the those things out again when I get a lot of my other characters up to tier six reputation because with a lot of the glitches that I've been having, it's been difficult to get into the game and stay in the game without it crashing. So I am working on some work workarounds. It's still a work in progress for it to be consistent for me though. But um, anyway, um, after all those changes and getting a lot of input from people, I started making a lot better builds that had at least noticeable DPS versus other people, and it had a lot, a lot better survivability. Um, however, because I've been so frustrated with, with the VOD war, I was like, I want to make sure that I get a starship that I can solo the VOD war missions without any chance of dying. That's that was that was my goal definitely because I got so mad at the Valwar missions. I want a mission that I can go elite and I, I, I can go in that, those missions in elite and not die. I have no chance of dying. So even with like Dark Blades videos, like people's videos, I wanted a build that still did tanking, still had decent DPS, but had super stupidly insane survivability. So I started creating some of my own methods that were even even more easy to execute than broadsiding, which was the forward firing method that I've talked about on, on this channel before. Um, and these were the starships that I started leaning more towards. Merc Walker Cruisers for broadsiding, and then the Walker class and the Flight Deck Cell Cruisers for the, my forward firing method. And um, I started to become so good that um, there's people that are really impressed in a lot, in a, in a lot of different queues and operations to the point that I got invited to some 1v1 private fights against some really good escort captains. I never lost any of those battles. Um, there were a few that we just declared ties because every time that they, that they would get low, they just kept on leaving the map so this, this, or leaving, leaving the area of fire so, this, so they couldn't die, but they also couldn't kill me either, so it didn't matter. Um, so it, it was either victories or draws for me. And so for me, as, as a tank player, that's perfectly fine with me. Um, thanks to you all with the Victory's Life with that coming out. Um, a lot of y'all pushed me to learn science, and so I finally did. Um, I learned a lot of the triangle stuff between science, engineering, and tactical, and how the different bounds between all those different professions work. I also learned how to have a science tank, which which is my version. It's, it, it's like a combo between the Mega Well type of builds that used to exist in Star Trek Online a couple of years ago. And were prevalent back then, as well as through different torpedo builds inside the game too. A combination of both of those is, is what, what my science tank is and what you'll see in two weeks. Of those types of builds, my favorite two ships is number one right now is the Fleet and Emergency Support Cruiser, followed very closely by the Science Miracle Worker Cruisers, which is the type that you would use if you're a Klingon captain, but you have to act, actually buy the ship from the sea store to use it. So, But anyway, that's my general journey. Um, in terms of why I went from where I was, from very casual player to a really good um, tank player inside the game. All right, so at the end of the day, should you tank in Star Trek Online? Um, I, I'm going to go through two basic points in here. First off, tanking is an extremely straightforward and simple playstyle. Charge into the action, attack to make enemies attack you, and then survive through it. Extremely simple. You, you can use that play style in basically any mission, any operation inside the game, and it works. It's awesome. It's not like different maps and things, like if you're a DPS captain, you might have to do different strategies in order to make sure they don't die. With tanking, same play style, every single mission, it works. It's great. It's awesome. Alongside that, you're able to be super helpful to other play styles inside the game too, and, and, and enhance basically every other play style inside the game. Do you have DPS chasers in, in your group? Congratulations, DPS chasers. You no, you no longer have any aggro. It's super easy to survive because you're not getting the aggro at all. Do you have a healer in your group? Well, 
Congratulations, healer. You only have one target that you actually have to worry about healing and keeping alive. Wow, your job is extremely simple now. Is there any other tanks in your group? Well, you can, you can either trade off aggro or you can also talk to each other about how to build tanks better because it's not going to be very often that you have multiple tanks in, in the same queue or operation because they're really rare inside the game. And then finally, are there any other new players in your group? Well, because tanking is so simple and straightforward, it, they, they are the easiest um, method to be able to start talking to other, other players and like during your TFO, explaining different things and helping them in their strategies too. So yeah, in my opinion, in terms of other things inside the game, they're the ultimate support character in Star Trek Online. The most um, versatile, best everything. I mean, sure, they're not going to be the best for DPS, but they're pretty good at everything else. Um, but anyway, here's my general tanking, tanking checklist to consider that the, if you want to be a tank, here's the things that you, you have to agree with. First off, I like simplicity and easy play styles in video games. If this is someone that's, that's like you, if you want the game to be simple and easy to play, tanking is a very easy way to do so. If you have a if you have a tank like on my channel, it's not it like basically any of the missions in Star Trek Online become extremely easy to play. It's almost like you're basically just playing the missions to play the story instead of having to play the missions to worry about the mechanics inside of the missions themselves. Same things with a lot of the TFOs too. Second off, I don't care about high DPS. Um, this is this is the big turnoff for tanking. Um, a lot of y'all that, that are like DPS chasers, you're like, yeah, but that's my thing. I don't care about survival as much. Like, I want to make sure that I'm doing as much DPS as possible. Completely valid point. If you're all about DPS, you don't want to be a tank captain. Pretty simple. However, I like not dying easily in missions and operations. When it comes down to tanking, the easiest way to um, not die in missions is to build yourself really tanky with lots of health, lots of damage resistance from stuff other than consoles. Um, so that missions and operations become really easy to play as well. I mean, there are some players that be like, I'm fine dying as long as I still have really high DPS numbers at the, at the end of the day. And that's fine. I'm, I'm someone personally that alongside these other points as a kind of role player inside of Star Trek online, I feel like it would seem more realistic that if you're actually going to be on, on, on the final frontier in Star Trek online, that you would want a ship that is relatively rugged and durable. Um, but that's just me personally. Um, the last point is I like helping other players. I, I know that there are some people who play Star Trek online that, you know, they also like, you know, those first person shooters that they're much, that they're much more solo based than team based. And that's totally fine. Um, tanks are very much more of, I'm playing this way so that I'm still a reliable, I'm still a reliable captain and ship inside the game. But I'm also there so that my other teammates are more enabled and, and, can, and can accomplish the missions much easier. If you agree with all four of those points in this tanking checklist, I would encourage you to consider tanking if you aren't already a tank inside the game. All right, so in this last point here um, in this video, I'm going to go over the three general tanking methods inside the game. Keep in mind there are many different ways to do TPS many different ways to survive inside the game. Different types of DPS require different ways to survive inside the game. So this is a very generalized type of, of little line here. It's actually more like lots of little circles and things are overlapping in terms of where things actually lie. But this is just a super simplistic thing of the, the three different tanking methods inside the game. The first one is the one that has several different names, but it's basically the same thing. Um, they're called off tanks, really. And they're basically a DPS build with a tiny, tiny bit amount of survival through consoles and traits that allow them to survive long enough so that their other high-end DPS players in their group can still finish off the other, the, the other enemies in whatever operation that you're playing. The Agronauts and many of your Reddit builds on tanking, many of your founding missions that say that you need to do this mission to tank, they're, they're, they want you to be an off-tank. That's what they actually want you to be, is a, is a DPS build person that has some survivability behind it. 
but mainly a DPS player. That's that's what they're really wanting. So if you're a DPS player but kind of are thinking about tanking, this is probably the one for you. If you agree with with the general checklist that I that I gave though, you might think about standard tanking. Um, they are the ones you simply think of when you think of tanking. They are they are the broadsiding players in cruisers. They have respectable DPS, um, and there are a decent balance between a DPS build and a pure survival build. Um, keep in mind, um, Dark Blades Channel is an extremely good resource for a lot of the a lot of these general standard tanking builds inside the game. Um, I mean, there's definitely better ones for DPS or better ones for survival, but in this kind of general realm, but Dark Blades is a pretty good place to start, in my opinion. Um, and then we can go into the third category, which is my category which is threat tanking. Now, go back four years, this was actually pretty prevalent for actual DPS um, because there used to be an ability called um, Feedback Pulse that was very strong, literally to the point that you could do lots of DPS and have Feedback Pulse, and the Feedback Pulse would also do a lot of damage too. With that gone, um, most people don't want to improve their threat generation besides tanks now inside the game. And also reducing threat doesn't matter as much because I mean, unless there is a tank in your group, if everyone's reducing their threat by a thousand percent, it's still as if everyone have, is doing the same amount of threat anyway. So, um, unless you have, a, you have a tank in your group, there isn't going to be a lot of threat um, reduction that's really that's really wanted inside of it. So, but general three behind this anyway, for me anyway, is all all I need to do as as a tank is do just enough DPS so that I'm pulling threat away from everyone else in my group. After that, I'm gonna pack in as much survival stuff and traits and consoles and skills as I possibly can so that I am nearly unkillable. My general rule of thumb, just for rough math, not for specific math, but for rough math, if you're dealing about 10% of the damage on average of the highest DPS player in your operation, you're doing a good job. And making sure that you're you're keeping the threat on you. Um, the general thresholds I typically have for the different operations is 10,000 DPS for normal operations, 20,000 for advanced, and 30,000 DPS for elite. Some of you DPS captains might think that is insanely low. Why would you recommend the, that extremely low thresholds for these? Well, with the way that general threat generation is with command strike fire and uh, threatening stance, is that on average assuming that, that you, the DPS player, are within the five kilometers of that um, tank player, that tank player is going to have 16 times the threat generation of their DPS stuff over you, which means that on average, they're, if it's a DPS captain with 10, 000, or a tank captain with 10,000 DPS, they actually would, would be effectively dealing 160,000 DPS threat generation to the enemy to the enemy N NPCs and ships inside the game, which means you as DPS captain would need to do greater than 160,000 damage per second in order to actually um, out-threaten the tank who's doing this little amount of DPS. Keep in mind, at 20, 30,000, this doubles and triples. And so, yeah, I mean, like, a lot of your super high-end DPS players inside the game will, be, or will boast, like, you know, yeah, I'm doing 100, 200, 300, 400,000 damage per second on average for, for this run. That's great. My builds will still out-threaten yours, even with extremely little DPS. And of course, with my builds, I'm still fairly unkillable in most missions inside the game. It's only an uncoordinated elite missions do actually have the risk of actually dying. For the actual gear itself for these different things, for normal, to get this amount of DPS for a, I'm just going to assume a broadside um, ship inside the game, you'll want Mark 12 very rare uh, equipment and consoles, which basically means if you get stuff from mission drops, like the, like regular mission rewards and um, rep reputation stuff, you'll be able to get this point and be able to do normals just fine. To do advanced, all you need is, is to get this mission reward and reputation stuff up to mark 15. If you want to do elite stuff, it's at that point that you have to do the serious upgrading to get everything to epic. But most people don't play epic stuff inside the game, and so in my opinion, that's not insanely necessary for tank captains inside the game. 
Now, if you're going to be, for instance, a standard tank or an off tank, you might want to veer more towards the more upgrading in order for it to be effective. Especially if you're going to be an off tank and your stuff is strictly around your DPS and your DPS for your survival, you're going to need much higher um, stuff for your DPS in order to be able to survive through a lot of the damage inside the game. But that's just my couple of cents on super general stuff about whether you should be a tank or not and the different types of tanking inside the game. Thank you all so much for liking and subscribing um, so much on, on this channel. Um, I'm not sure how I can thank you all enough for how much support I've already received thus far on, on this channel. I mean, like back in August, we only had a couple dozen people subscribe to this channel. And now just a few months later, we're in the hundred, we're, we're in the hundreds, you know, and I think that is super insanely awesome. But yeah, feel free to like and subscribe and comment um, if you like this, this, this video and this content. And yeah, um, thank you all for watching so much. Enjoy your time in Star Trek Online and yeah, enjoy the rest of your day.